Good morning and welcome to day two of the Ground Ambulance and Patient Billing Advisory Committee meeting one. My name is Tara Sanderson and I will be serving as the facilitator for today's webinar. We have a number of subject matter experts with us today who will provide information on various ground ambulance and patient billing topics. Today's session is being recorded by your attendance here today. You are giving consent to the use and distribution of your name, likeliness, and voice during this webinar. Before we dive into the discussion today, there are a few logistics that may be helpful for participation in today's session. If you need to connect your audio, you will follow the audio prompts that appear when you join Zoom. We recommend using the Call Me or Computer Audio options to ensure your name is synced with your audio. If you select Call Me, enter your phone number, including the area code. If you have an extension, you can enter your phone number followed by a hyphen and then your extension. Your meeting controls are located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can manage your audio by using the audio icons in the bottom left hand corner of your toolbar. These icons will allow you to join audio, mute or unmute. To view the chat box, you will need to click the chat icon in the toolbar. We will be taking committee and public comments at the end of each session today. To participate, you can submit your questions via chat by typing your message into the chat box and hitting enter to send. We hope everyone has a great experience on the webinar today. However, if you run into technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to send us a message and we will respond to you directly. We will begin this morning with Kim Stanley, who will be presenting an overview of billing practices among ground ambulance provider types. Hi, good morning. Appreciate the opportunity to speak today with the, such a, a vast um, amount of experience in the industry. Um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I've been with EMS Management and Consultants or EMSMC for 20 years as the Chief Compliance Officer. Prior to that, I spent 11 years at a Medicare uh, administrative contractor um, and was actually involved in negotiated rulemaking and, and policy change for ambulance services um, over 20 years ago. So excited to be here today and to be able to present. Uh, the topic that I was given was just an overview of the billing practices amongst the ground ambulance providers. Next slide. And I felt like it was very important that I um, share just a little bit about EMSMC and, and who we all represent um, in order to share some of the demographic data that I'll share today. Um, I used the, the national footprint that we had during the period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022, because that's the data set that I'll actually be talking to today. And that represents about 287 ground ambulance providers about 2.3 million claims with 23 states represented. Um, that we represent about 58% rural with 42% urban and that's uh, classified through the ambulance fee schedule is whether or not they are primarily an urban or a rural service. Next slide. So of that data, um, I wanted to designate what types of agencies are actually included in that data set. And so, uh, primarily, obviously, it's government agencies, um, municipalities such as counties, towns, uh, municipal townships, so and so forth and so on. Um, we do represent quite a few private not-for-profits, and for that, I would say uh, mostly volunteer rescue squads, um, paid rescue squads. Um, they are uh, not classified as a municipality, but they're they're non-for-profit um, at the same time. Um, a small percentage, about 11% that are private for-profit. Um, most of those in that category would be providing either backup to the 911 system, um, may be the, the private uh, primary 911 provider, but a large majority of them are providing the non-emergency discharges inter facility transports that were spoken of uh, very heavily yesterday. And then about 7.3% would be hospital-based. Um, those are EMS systems or hospital uh, facilities that are providing ambulance services. Um, I think it is important to say that we only represent ambulance or EMS systems. And so the data that I'm sharing truly are uh, ground ambulance services. Next slide. 
um, thought this was very interesting when we take those 2.3 million claims over those 287 providers. What does that primary payer mix look like? And I'll just define primary payer mix as who pays first, right? So that's uh, this does not include copays and uh, secondary payers. This is who's paying first on the claims that we're going to share information. Um, and I thought this was really interesting. The Medicare combined is about 50.8%. And if I look over our client base, um, if I looked at them individually, I would say the majority of them are about 50% Medicare. Um, and that's including Medicare as well as the Medicare Advantage plans. Um, one thing that we are seeing is a rise in that Medicare Advantage plan. So if I looked at this same data, say five years ago, it'd be a much higher percentage of Medicare traditional than it was Medicare Advantage. And now those two numbers look very, very similar to each other. Um, the next category that we looked at was patient, and that's 16.58% of the data that I reviewed. Um, patient being the primary payer means it's uninsured. Um, so we were either not able to provide, uh, not able to gather insurance information, or in, the mo in most cases, um, because this is uh, mature data, um, the, you know, those patients do not have any type of insurance coverage. It is important that I point that out. I use the July 1, 2021 data through June 30, 22 data because I wanted to look at mature claims, claims that had already gone through the billing process. We've gathered insurance information. We filed to primary, secondary insurance companies. And for the most part, these claims are uh, closed. They're mature trips in which we can uh, look at this primary payer mix. Um, so a, a couple other interesting facts. Um, you know, if I look at our payer mix across all of these payers, 69%, let's call it 70% almost, um, we're already bound to some type of fee schedule based payer. Um, obviously, Medicare, Medicaid, that's been discussed uh, in previous presentations. But if you add in, say, facilities, VAs, TRICARE, uh, workers' comp, we are already mandated to a lower than gross charge amount in which we bill for those payers. So about 70% of those were already restricted and uh, are only able to bill up to that allowed amount, depending on the payer. Um, another interesting fact here is insurance, and that's what we're talking about, right? This is commercial insurance. Now, I did not have a way to segregate self-funded plans from this number, um, but of that 2.3 million claims and 287 providers, we're talking about a, around 13%. Um, that are covered by a commercial insurance company. Um, like I said, that would include what we're speaking of today, as well as those self-funded and other types of plans. Next slide. The other question that I was asked to uh, talk about is just what, is, what does that patient invoicing cycle look like? And I know that that can be different amongst uh, different ambulance services and even other billing agencies. Um, I would say our standard invoicing process is uh, a 30, 60 day, 90, I'm sorry, 30, 60 day, 90 day or an interval. Um, so that means that we're going to bill to the extent of insurance. Um, once the insurance has paid, meaning their pr primary, their secondary, even a tertiary plan that they might be enrolled in, if there is a balance left to be paid, depending on the payer, um, then we're going to invoice the patient a 30 day, a 60 day and a 90 day interval. Um, so much of that is dependent on the client on really what happens after that 90 day invoice. Um, as I said, we're primarily representing government municipality areas and we have 56 of the 287 that actually utilize what we call an area resident program. And what that means is if they're a bona fide tax paying resident and there's lots of uh, there's actually a safe harbor and lots of advisory opinions on establishing what we call an area resident program. But if they're a bona fide tax paying citizen of that community, their tax paying dollars can actually be counted toward the co-insurance. And so in those programs, we bill to the extent of insurance and then that balance is written off for those tax paying citizens of that community. Um, we have 19 clients of the 287 that actually utilize a, a membership or subscription program. And what that means is uh, that they pay an amount that is very close to what a typical co-insurance amount would be. 
and then they enroll their themselves or their family members into what is called either a membership or a subscription program. And they pay that as uh, kind of an insurance policy, so to speak, for ambulance programs. And then it works very similar to the area resident program. If they're part of that membership program, then we're billing to the extent of insurance and then any subsequent balances are written off. Now there's rules and regulations related to that. And obviously Medicaid recipients are not allowed to participate in the membership and subscription programs. Um, but those have been uh, pretty successful for some of our EMS agencies across the country. So uh, as again uh, said, I'm representing 287 of this data subset and 110 of them actually use some type of third party collection agency, meaning that at the end of that 90 day cycle, the patient receives three invoices from us and that third, that third letter would then state that if the patient does not call to set up a payment program, uh, does not uh, make a payment on the claim that it would go to one of those third party collection agencies. Might not be the time and place to talk about that, but a lot of those rules and regulations have changed over the past year. And so we're starting to see um, a, a difference in the way that those agencies are able to collect on medical debt. Um, and then every single one of our clients have some, some type of financial hardship or charity care policies. Um, you know, whether that's uh, through the municipality and it's a, a very specific policy in which that patient can contact our office or send in certain information to let us know that they have a financial hardship. Um, in a lot of cases, we uh, partner with the hospitals. So if the hospital has already identified that patient as a charity care policy recipient, uh, that the ambulance company would, would follow suit and, and develop their financial hardship around that hospital's program. Next slide. Um, so the last question I was asked to, to answer here is how are uh, charges or rates established and uh, being careful because I know there was some conversation yesterday about what these terms and definitions are. Um, I, for the purposes of today, I'm talking about the gross charges or the rates. Um, a lot of our clients refer to that as their charge master. Um, government agencies, because that's the majority of who we represent. Um, those are determined by the elected officials. And so uh, a community, a, a county EMS agency, uh, in order to set their rates and then in, uh, any subsequent increases to those rates, um, that has to go back to the county commissioners, the county court, the county of supervisors, uh, called differently in, uh, different things in different areas or regions of the country. Um, but those elected officials have to vote in order for them to establish the rates and then any subsequent increases to those rates over time. Uh, private agencies, they are typically determined by those surrounding agencies. So um, as I said, we represent a, a small amount of private agencies across the country, um, but in most cases, um, they're only allowed to charge what the elected officials for that municipality have set as the rate. Um, so, for example, if a county EMS system has a rate structure in place, if someone is coming in to back up that 911 system, they're still bound by the rates that have been set by those government agencies and those regulatory uh, environments. And then hospital agencies, those are usually determined by their board of directors. Um, and, and the same could still apply for hospital agencies as well if, if they have franchises or if they have ordinances or contracts to um, provide services within a certain municipality that that municipality then might determine what that hospital-based EMS system may charge for their services. So with that, I'm happy to be here. As I said, I appreciate this opportunity um, and I look forward to any questions that you have at the end of the session. Thank you, Kim. Next, we have Peter Lawrence, who will provide an overview of EMS billing. Good morning, uh, Pete Lawrence with the Oceanside Fire Department in Southern California. And again, appreciate the opportunity to be part of the uh, Ground Ambulance and Patient Billing Advisory Committee. I appreciate the assistance and the work that's been done by CMS um, to get us to this point because it's a difficult process having been involved in negotiated rulemaking. As one of the negotiators, I understand the difficulties 
Um, I'd also like to point out and appreciate uh, the assistance that Provider Resources is putting forward because this is a very efficient um, meeting. They're doing a very good job of keeping us going. So with that, I'll try to stay on track here. Next slide. So just a disclaimer, this is a high level view of how the Oceanside Fire Department bills for EMS and transports. It's, it's not gonna be all inclusive in the amount of time I've got. And it's also not indicative of how any other fire service entity bills for service, but it, it does show a lot of what takes place in the government of the fire service um, billing process. But it, I, I'm not saying that this is the way the fire service bills across the country. Next slide. So I was very fortunate to know and work with Jim Page, one of the people considered the father of EMS. And he always said that you want an EMS system because again, it's a system to be three things, fast, efficient, and cost-effective. But then you only get to choose two. If you wanna be fast and efficient, it's not gonna be cost-effective. If you wanna be cost-effective and efficient, it's not gonna be fast. The issue with EMS is we don't know when necessarily that next call is coming in and where that next call is coming in. Oceanside is 41 square miles, but we also provide service outside of our city when the other jurisdictions around us are not able to provide either an engine or an ambulance. When you get to agencies like Los Angeles City, New York City, Houston, very, very large organizations, You've trying to provide service across a very large area and you can't be all three. So next slide. So the city of Oceanside provides ALS first response and both ALS and BLS transport units from eight stations. We're about 180,000 population on the coast north of San Diego. Our call volume is 22,000 calls per year. 80% um, of which have a medical aspect reported. Actually, it's 24,000 calls now. 60% um, of EMS calls re result in a transport, 40% result in no transport. And our ambulances are staffed with a combination of firefighter paramedics and emergency medical technicians. Next slide. Up until 2010, Oceanside performed their own billing of ambulance claims. And ambulance claims, for those people who aren't familiar with them, is about as complex as the tax code. There are lots of nuances to them. And in 2010, uh, we had transferred billing back to our finance department a couple of years before, and then uh, decided we could not do it. And so we went and contracted with a professional billing service, Whitman Enterprises. For insurance claims, we bill base rates, and we only bill at the emergency level, BLS emergency, ALS one emergency and ALS two. We do not do non-emergency transports unless there's no other option. And they're normally coming from the hospital going somewhere. And we will, because the main hospital is in the city of Oceanside, we will end up sending a, a unit over there. But historically we, we are an emergency 911 entity. Mileage, disposable supplies when certain conditions are met, medications. We do an assessment fee, but it's a small fee and it's only when we are called by the patient or the family or the caregiver. We get a lot of traffic accidents. We have two freeways and, and a large uh, state highway going through the city of Oceanside. And so we end up with a lot of traffic accidents when somebody calls and says, hey, there's been an accident and we show up and do an assessment and nobody has been injured or needs assistance. We do not charge those people. Uh, because they weren't the ones who called. And we do have a fee for dead on scene patients uh, because it, I was part of the negotiations with then HICFA, now CMS, um, in order to try to get reimbursement for when we provide service on scene because, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, EMS has done a very good job of trying to save patients at the scene, stabilize them, if we can't, we don't transport them. If we transport them, it would generate tremendous costs. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Next slide. Oceanside does not recover our cost of providing EMS through reimbursements. Other city funds, we have property tax and sales tax have to be used to support the EMS system. And again, it's a system. And the system involves paramedic staffed engine companies and paramedic and EMT staff ambulances. And again, as we talked about yesterday briefly, there are requirements in the 911 systems pretty much throughout 
the country where you have to have a paramedic at scene in a certain specified period of time, normally at a 90% interval. So 90% of the time you have to get a, a unit there, paramedic, and then you have to get an ambulance there in another specified period of time. If you don't have paramedics on your engine company and you have a requirement for those uh, paramedics to be there at a specific time, you have to have them on all the ambulances. And then you now have paramedics on all your ambulances, which isn't necessarily the most efficient, especially when you've got wall times and you've got BLS patients being transported longer distances away from your city. So our base rates are broken down into resident and non-resident charges because of the use of uh, other city funds. And again, because we are subsidized by the city, and if they didn't subsidize the fire department, our library system or our parks and rec system would be a lot more robust, but they have to provide this service. So the non-resident rate offsets the amount that residents already pay in the form of taxes. And that is done by a lot of agencies when you've got that um, information or that uh, financial support from the government taxes. Next slide, please. So we bill using the Medicare definitions, even though they're technically not required or technically not applicable to the, uh, uh, the non-Medicare system. BLS emergency, it's a standard 911 call. An emergency call is when you access it via 911. And again, as part of the negotiated rulemaking process, we had a very long series of conversations about establishing what a an emergency call was. And if it comes through 911 and you begin the process to immediately respond, it's considered an emergency. And we need to be careful about that being changed because yes, when we get there, maybe the individual is not suffering a life-threatening emergency, but the prudent layperson standard and the fact that it was accessed through 911 qualifies it as an emergency for reimbursement purposes. ALS-1 is at least one medication or one ALS skill, the minor skills. ALS-2 is the high acuity ALS calls with multiple meds and airway, defibrillation, cardioversion. And I'll tell you that when we discussed all of this last century, I'm not sure I like saying that, but last century as part of the uh, negotiated rulemaking process, the data that came from then the Healthcare Financing Administration, HICFA, was not that good with regards to what the level of care between ALS-2 and ALS-1 is. It really is only one to 3% of your system volume. A lot of that also comes into play because those patients that we used to just load, the cardiac arrest patients load and transport are now being treated at the scene. And most of the medical directors are requiring that we go through three rounds of medications trying to return the spontaneous circulation, Rossi, before we get them in the ambulance and transport them. So the, again, the ALS-2 criteria is a little out of date. It doesn't take into account some of the high-level ALS skills or expensive single-dose meds introduced since then. So it's something that probably needs to be, uh, be looked at. Next slide. So we do an annual adjustment because city councils hate having to come back to evaluate fees because there's always people asking questions. Um, we looked at how we could do an automated automatic adjustment. And obviously the ambulance inflation factor when it first came out was a very good use of the uh, CPI. It was based on national and it worked. But after the uh, Affordable Care Act, a productivity factor, and I brought this up yesterday, a productivity factor was added and the city switched to CPI Urban San Diego. So our, our general area is now used as the appropriate adjustment method. So our base rates adjust annually. And as I brought up yesterday, and I will get the information to um, the CMS folks, the own actuaries from CMS stated at the time that the application of a productivity factor to suppliers such as ambulance services was inappropriate. And uh, Richard Foster, who was the chief EMS, the CMS chief actuary at the time, in November 13 of 2009, he said that the provision of host healthcare services tend to be very labor intensive. Economy-wide productivity gains reflect relatively modest improvement in the service sector together with much larger improvements in manufacturing. Except in the case of 
physician services, we are not aware of any empirical evidence demonstrating the medical community's ability to achieve productivity improvements equal to those of the overall economy. And was, they were not very um, supportive of it. I've got other back documentation as well, and I'll get that off. But I just wanna bring this up because we gotta make sure that this committee does not use annual adjustments if we're gonna do that using the AIF because it is artificially reduced and CMS's own actuaries say it's really not applicable. It, it says we've got to essentially do twice the rate of economy-wide multi-factor productivity to even break even. So next slide. So time on task. Um, the base rate we charge is the same charge for a transport that takes 45 minutes or takes three hours. Some of the hospital-based services that are provided, they're done on daily rates, they're done on, on time on task. There's, there's different types of billing, but when it comes to ambulance, you have a base rate. There is no extra charge for waiting time at the hospital because waiting time, the way it's described is waiting time is to pick up the patient when you're gonna be taking the patient somewhere. So if we want, you know, I, I see that people are talking about waiting time, but the waiting time doesn't include the hospital at the end. Historically, it's being charged only for when you show up at a facility to pick up a patient and you're told you have to wait. And a lot of that is specialty care. On average, our paramedics these days, our ambulances are sitting at the hospital in the 60 minute time frame. Our record is eight hours. And we've got crews that are sitting at hospitals waiting for beds. And in many cases, it's because of the lack of nurses. A lot of times emergency room beds are being taken up by people that are waiting to be admitted to upper floors. And it is driving the nurses and the emergency room staff crazy. And a lot of them are leaving. But we can have units out of service for a long period of time. And there's no additional charge that we can provide or we can charge for additional cardiac monitoring, repeated vitals, ongoing assessments. We essentially become staff of the hospital if you look under MTALA. Additionally, patients in Oceanside don't wait for one of our ambulances. We have a very robust system that dispatches the closest units, engines and ambulances to calls, regardless of jurisdictional boundary. If we aren't available for an ambulance because they're stuck at the hospital an adjacent agency comes into Oceanside and they bill for that service. Oceanside receives nothing in those cases for providing the ALS engine on the response because again, our bills are for the EMS system and not just for the ambulance transport because we are stopping the clock with the paramedics showing up on the engine because the engine's getting there the vast majority of the time first. There are times we have ambulances coming from 15 miles away because it's a busy day in Oceanside. Next slide, please. So our mileage charge is adjusted annually, but it's based on actual costs because again, we try to be realistic. Additionally, a lot of government entities are prohibited from making a profit on their system. I know that that's the case in California. I cannot make more than the cost of providing service. I'm prohibited by law. So I have to make sure that my actual cost is what is the cost of providing ambulances. So we look at what is the cost to repair fuel and replace the ambulance fleet. We then evaluate it divide it by the loaded miles and that sets the charge for the um, for the subsequent fiscal year. Our medications are charged to cost plus 100%. It accounts for the wasting, expiration, the cost of storage and a secure distribution system because again, a lot of the ambul or a lot of the uh, hospitals in the 1990s decided that the anti-kickback statutes were prohibiting them from doing a medication exchange and then they would charge for the medication it prohibited them from even giving us the medications at their cost. So fire departments and EMS providers, public and private alone, um, equally, had to get distribution systems for their medications that met all of the Drug Enforcement Administration rules. And we couldn't be securing our, our narcotics, just leaving them in a fire station, leaving them in an ambulance station, leaving them in the units, they had to be secured. So we have a very robust distribution system. And so the cost plus 100% accounts for all of those things. We adjust those fees every six months uh, in order to take account for what is going on. But again, a lot of the providers, Medicaid, Medicare, do not reimburse for medications. So we do um, 
if they if the patient is is not billed like a dead on scene they aren't covered by insurance and so we do not uh we do not bill for medications when we are doing them for a patient who's dead on scene because it's not reimbursed. We're trying not to saddle the patient with a tremendous amount of bills. Next. So disposable supplies in our case are bundled into two charges. We went through in 2012 and yes, that's 12, 10 years ago. And we identified an analysis of when we are doing spinal immobilization, when we're doing childbirth, airway, CPAP, et cetera, what are the charges? what are the disposable supplies that are used? And we determined what they were so we're not having to itemize supplies as supplies because that drives the insurance companies crazy. And it's a tremendous amount of work for the billing entities. Well, only one bundle gets charged regardless of how many services are provided. So, you know, we recently had a cardiac arrest patient on an individual who was pregnant and ended up giving birth. We only charge one supply charge for that, it's a bundle. Next. So again, a paramedic ALS equipped engine, all of North San Diego County works with this system. So there's a paramedic on every engine so that the, uh, the system works um, across borders. It's dispatched every medical call along with an ALS or BLS ambulance. So the, again, the engine arrives on scene first the majority of the time. My slowest engine company is about uh, 2,200 calls a year. My busiest engine company is 3,800 calls a year. My ambulances are in the 4,000 calls a year basis. So we're trying to add units uh, in order to keep pace. So if we're called to the scene of a medical emergency and don't transport, we charge an assessment fee of $100. Again, that's only if the patient or a family member or a caregiver calls. We do not charge for a bystander who calls and says, hey, somebody looks like they're injured. Um, or they just observed a, uh, a person crash on their bike. The Oceanside Fire Department provides fire rescue and marine services. So we're also supporting our beach. We have a very, very large beach population during the summer, uh, which is now actually year round. Um, so there's times that people call and say that somebody is struggling in the water. And if they dial 911, an engine company as well as the lifeguards go. And our lifeguards are very good providers of medical care. They're part of our team, but they're only at the EMS, the EMT level. Many insurance companies do not pay for non-transport services. So the patient is left to pay the full amount of the bill. And we understand that. And we try to, again, be responsive for what we are charging. Um, but we also have to ensure that the city is made whole as much as possible. Next. So again, I talked briefly about dead on scene. If the patient's pronounced at the scene, and obviously this is if, if we're providing care, if we just show up, um, that would be just the assessment. But if, if we show up and the individual has worked at the scene, and for those of you who are EMS professionals, and we just saw that great video yesterday out of Portland of the organized chaos of a cardiac arrest scene, when we show up and that individual is being worked as a cardiac arrest patient, it's an ALS2 call. It is all hands on deck and everything that you can do, multiple meds, airways, intraosseous, okay, defibrillation, cardioversion, all of those things that fall into that ALS2 rate. But in most of those cases, we don't get a return of spontaneous circulation. The patient is pronounced at the scene and the patient does not get transported. Yet had we transported that patient, it would have been the highest acuity transport and the patient and the insurance company would have been billed at a significantly higher rate for all of the services provided and they would have reimbursed us at the ALS2 rate. So one of the issues here is, is that we do all this care at the scene and some insurance companies do not consider that to be a, a medical transportation coverage. It's like showing up at the hospital and you die in the emergency room and the insurance company says, I'm not gonna pay because you didn't save them. So next. So destination, we don't get the opportunity to just say, we're taking you here or taking you there because in some cases we have to account for specialty care, status, trauma, burns, pediatric. Sometimes I have to fly them even in San Diego County. The issue is, is that we can only deliver patients right now to hospitals. There's a li limited movement and we had a great presentation you know, on ET3 and, and some of the community paramedicine stuff yesterday. 
limited a movement to begin allowing for transport to urgent care, et cetera. I can't even take patients and get reimbursed by taking them to a mental health facility or a sobering center. I got to drop them at a jail and I don't get paid, or I got to take them to the emergency room and they really don't like getting those patients. So we don't have the opportunity to just choose that we're just going to go to the closest provider because we also account for taking patients to their in network hospital, their hospital of choice. The issue being is, is that if I take Mrs. Smith and I drop Mrs. Smith at the hospital that works best for my paramedics to get them back in the system fastest, that patient may be subjected to significant out of network charges or excessive copays. That's not appropriate. So we end up taking the patient to the hospital of their choice to keep them within their network. And sometimes we get people who complain or insurance companies that say, you know, you could have come to a closer hospital. Uh, we can't. Insurance companies routinely consider ambulance suppliers to be out of network. And we heard that yesterday. The vast majority of our claims are considered out of network. And the, the, the patient has no choice when they call 911. Almost all of the 911 services in the United States are designated based on geographic or political boundaries, you don't get a choice when you dial 911. And there's no ability to sit down and have conversations as well as, as a government entity, if I negotiate with an insurance company and I say, I'm gonna give you a discount, that's a gift of public funds because I'm not making, I'm not recovering it. And that money then comes from libraries, comes from parks, comes from the, uh, the, pres the preservation of our roads. So it has to be- I could, If I could get you to wrap up in maybe three yep. minutes. Thank yep. you. Next. Insurance collections, some pay immediately, minus the copay. In California, we're fortunate. We get paid directly by the insurance provider. It doesn't go to the, uh, to the patient. Again, most are transported out of network, and then they come up with an appropriate amount. And sometimes it's uh, the, the best EOBs I love are the ones that say, if you question our, our reimbursement, we reserve the right to question your charges. Alan here. So, some require the patient to appeal the amount, some require the transporting agency to appeal and then they pay the full amount. And if you look at our 2019 data, ALS was billed between 50 or paid by insurance 53 to 100%. BLS was 48 to 95%. Kaiser, thank God, pays 91% or greater on all calls and our longest, largest single insurance payer. Next. Done. Thank you, Pete. We will now hear from Sean Baird, who will discuss the private ambulance service suppliers billing practice profile. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am uh, Sean Baird. I'm a licensed paramedic, and uh, I've owned and operated uh, for much of my career a 9 primary 911 ambulance service in a rural community in Oregon. Uh, in the, the last uh, three or four years, I've been vice president of a group of 12 companies serving uh, counties as primary 911 provider, uh, counties of up to 600,000 in population down to as little as 75,000 uh, residents in an entire county in uh, rural Oregon and Washington. And I am the immediate past president of the American Ambulance Association. And I'm excited here to talk to you this morning a little bit about uh, private EMS and how a billing profile might look for us. Uh, much of what I will cover uh, is very similar to what Pete uh, just discussed, as well as our first presentation on um, the actual uh, sort of more day-to-day -day type of billing uh, activities that occur within a business office. So, uh, with that next slide, please. What is private EMS? Um, well, it's very similar to uh, every type of EMS in, in the service we provide on the street. It's very different at the back end, primarily because we're self-funded through fees. We don't have any access to any kind of supplementary funding um, to fill the gap between what we can achieve in reimbursement and what it costs us to provide the care. So there's no uh, tax subsidy, there's no bond to build a building, uh, no GEMT supplemental funds or, or 
by and large, no grant funding available to uh, private services. Um, we're very flexible. We have to be to operate in that kind of environment. We're scalable, you know, as I mentioned, we're in little tiny towns and we're in great big cities. Uh, and we strive to connect patients to where they need to be across any kind of jurisdictional line. Um, we, aren't, we aren't tied to uh, particular districts or, or uh, other types of uh, regulatory jurisdiction, except for when we're the 911 provider. And of course, then we work within whatever the boundary that's set by the appropriate authorities determining who that provider will be. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I can kind of skip over a lot of this. It's been covered pretty heavily here that we're mostly small services like my uh, former company. 75% um, bill fewer than three transports a day. Can't help but keep hammering that. I mean, one of the things that uh, I worked on last May, I got a call from a small community on the Idaho-Oregon border that uh, they were unable to continue to support their municipal service and they were going into a budget cycle that started in June and they weren't going to be able to pay the bills and they were very concerned that they wouldn't have ambulance service for their residents and it was a you know 75 to 100 mile trip from this small town in Oregon to Idaho where any kind of ICU or major medical facilities existed. Within days, I was able to deploy uh, initially one ambulance crew and now two uh, and just get them there. And then over the next uh, few months by October, we had a, a system set up in place. Uh, now, with that being said, that system can't afford to have its own sophisticated billing office and everything else to support it. What I have there are the crews that run the calls and the vehicles and equipment, and um, and we've been able to find space to house them. But we can't support an entire ambulance infrastructure to serve those two or three calls a day that that system generates. Um, however, for that community, it's critical because they have no access to care without the ambulance service, particularly in the winter months when you can't get in and out. Um, next slide, please. So how do we pay for that? Well, as you've seen with the other groups, it's primarily Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage. Um, this is a sample, uh, the pie graph there is a sample payer mix of looking at um, 10 companies within three states that we did with the AAA. You see that it kind of lines up, although um, we're, we're seeing an increasing uh, amount of Medicaid patients uh, particularly in the areas where I work in the Northwest, uh, as more and more people move on to that system. Uh, commercial insurance in the 12 to 15% range is pretty typical in the organizations that I work with. And then when we look at bill patient, uh, much of that turns into charity care, which I'll cover here in a moment. Um, we don't really have a, a lot of other outside funding sources. And uh, while there are occasionally uh, communities that offer subsidies, it, it's very rare uh, in the private sector to have that exist. Next slide, please. Cost of readiness, uh, I think we've covered this. This is all in the, in the uh, CMS cost data collection piece, but basically there's a lot that goes into running a service as I think we're all familiar with. Next slide, please. So the billing paperwork avalanche, um, it's very difficult to uh, be able to be familiar with the literally hundreds of plans that are out there. And particularly in these smaller communities where um, you have people passing through, uh, maybe have a medical emergency or an accident. Um, they're not affiliated with any of the plans even offered within that state or region. Um, it takes a lot of work to, uh, to track down uh, and to process these kind of bills. And it's very difficult for small providers. Next slide, please. So the question of the day, why are patients left in the middle? You know, why, why are we not uh, able to recover enough to keep it going? Well, I looked at my own uh, Regents uh, Benefits Handbook to ask myself that question, and I put a little the little block up there, plan ahead is a, is a little screenshot from there. And it says, when you need care in a hurry, 
the last thing you want to think about is your plans network. Absolutely true. And I think I would, like most patients, take that at face value and assume that if I had to get care in a hurry and call an ambulance, I, I wouldn't be worried about it. Unfortunately, the surprise is that there are a lot of insurance underpayments and that places a, a burden on patients. Um, I think that uh, Lauren Adler earlier in one of the presentations mentioned that something like 60% of uh, insurance, commercial insurance actually pays uh, the, full, the full load on ambulance calls, which would imply then that the problem is that 40% of them don't and surprise their subscribers with uh, not covering the full service. When we do bill, um, in, the, in the example I looked at one of our organizations in Washington, uh, just to get an example, we collect about 23 cents for any dollar that we bill directly to a patient. And that's including co-pays, that's including deductibles and, and any other uh, patient responsibility as in like if, if they had no insurance at all and received an entire bill. We don't wanna bill patients, uh, just like the, the person from the uh, billing service earlier talked about. Uh, Hardship policies are in place. We do everything we can to avoid that and, and try to find a third party payer. But at the end of the day, we also have to continue to stay in service to be able to answer the next call. Next slide, please. So what gets in the way of uh, reimbursement? Well, one of, the, one of the problems is basically just because of the nature of what it is we do. We respond to every call, whoever calls for help, we send someone there 24 seven, we don't get to pick who those callers are and, and take a, a distribution model that accounts for the right payer mix. Um, when we do answer those calls, it's often difficult to even obtain the information from the patients or their families. They may, there may be no one else present at the scene. There may be uh, language barriers, there may be an inability to collect uh, signatures that are required uh, in the billing process, um, PCS forms, et cetera, can sometimes be hard to track down even on inter-facility work, much less in the 911 side. Um, and different payers have different laborious requirements. For example, the VA requires full patient hospital records to accompany the ambulance reimbursement request. These things get very, very difficult to achieve. Next slide, please. Some of the other payers uh, have uh, their own challenges to them. Um, we've talked about earlier with uh, Medicare Advantage, the higher amount of uh, patient cost shift. And then when you think about, okay, and if we're only collecting 23 cents on the dollar for co-pays and deductibles as the Medicare Advantage plan shifts from maybe an 80% of the allowed amount being paid to 30 or 40%, and the rest goes to the patient burden, but patients only pay 23 cents, it's, it's putting unbelievable strain on that patient as well as on the system that provided the care when they needed it. Uh, Medicaid reimbursements are very, you know, state by state, but in the state of Washington, uh, reimbursement can be $115. Well, if you use a single interosseous needle and we don't, we have to bundle bill, we don't bill uh, medical supplies in that area, um, that's, you, your whole cost is used up without even covering your personnel or the response or anything else. Um, and commercial insurers, I just wanted to take that back. We saw from Kathy Lester's presentation, I believe a, uh, screenshot of a letter from an insurer saying, hey, we want you to go in network. We'll offer you this, this rate if you do, uh, but if you don't, you're gonna get this rate anyway. And that's pretty typical of the uh, type of approach on any sort of um, payer negotiation. Next slide, please. So all of this, uh, while it puts the patient in a horrible spot, also puts the EMS system in a horrible spot. We've had uh, dozens of closures uh, in recent months of uh, ambulance services all over the place. I, I just mentioned the one that last May and June we had to go set up on, on short notice. 
uh, fortunately we could make it work. But there are communities where these are closing and there's not going to be someone right there to come in and help out. Um, it's going to uh, put a lot of things in peril. And what's most disturbing to me about this is that when I look at the headlines, like United Healthcare, which uh, in the fourth quarter of last year showed record profits of over $4 billion. United Optum combined had a $20 billion profit for 2022. Um, some of this makes it maybe not so hard to ask the, the, to find the answer to the question of uh, what's happening to patients who are caught in the middle. Next slide, please. So let's get them out of the middle. When insurance is needed most, it's because it's an emergency. You've got to get the care. You don't want to worry about it. Just like my, my Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, thing said, you know, it's the last thing you want to worry about. Certainly as ambulance providers and EMS professionals, we do our part by caring for patients every day, all day. Our patients are doing their part. They're paying their premiums. So why are the insurers failing to pull their weight by sustainably reimbursing for life-saving and life-sustaining mobile medical care. Next slide, please. So just to look at a typical uh, day on one of the units, uh, I looked at one of our services in uh, Washington state. The population there is 27% Medicaid. Sean, if I can get you wrap up in a minute or two, please. Yep, this is the last slide. 27% uh, Medicaid. 39% of the emergency Medicaid calls there are reimbursed at $115. It takes two to seven hours of call time uh, to, to complete one of those calls. And if they the, one of the two local hospitals is closed, meaning that the remaining hospital has very limited capacity. So out of these four responses, let's, let's just look at an average. You might have a treat in place, somebody who didn't get transported, zero reimbursement. You might have a Medicaid transport who was either $115 or $168. You might have one commercially insured patient, and then you've got to figure out out of the hundred and hundreds of different plans available what they might pay. And, and a Medicare Advantage uh, patient who you're lucky to get 30 or 40% uh, of the allowed charge and then 23 cents on the dollar for their patient responsibility. Next slide, please. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to discuss what a private EMS billing profile might look like. Thank you, Sean. I'll now turn it over to Asbel for community and public feedback for session one. So we probably won't get into any public feedback. I think this is some great information out there, but I wanna open it up to some committee members. We're running up against time, but we'll give you about five or 10 minutes because this is an important issue to see if anyone from the committee has any questions for these presenters. Two of them do sit on the committee, so if we don't get to your question, I will try to get to it later on during the day as well. Anybody have any questions? Not seeing any. Kim, I had one for you, if I can. These area resident programs that you are talking about, um, that are more on the tax base side. You mentioned something about some type of safe harbors that are out there um, where the resident doesn't get a bill, like you just bill what I call insurance only billing. Can you uh, confirm to me what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so uh, when the area resident programs were going on several years ago or being established, there were a lot of advisory opinions that were being written and to whether or not it was actually legal um, from the OIG's perspective to use the tax paying dollars that they were paying to supplement their Medicare co-insurance amounts. And because of the number of OIG advisory opinions that were received, OIG set up a uh, safe harbor to establish what was uh, acceptable in establishing these area resident programs. Perfect. So the OIG put a safe harbor in. I want to make a note here, um, Dr. Halim, as well, that we might need to get the OIG to come give us in subcommittee some information around what the, the safe harbors are, because um, it appears that it is a patient protection um, as well. 
Um, I see someone, Larry Field. I'm not really sure who that is. Um, I'm the medical director from Provider Resources. Okay, perfect. Um, go ahead with your question. Um, it was the same question as addressed to Tim in the, in the chat, um, which was obviously you have Medicare Advantage plans that are pretty much limited county by county. Um, and usually there's one or two dominant within a specific county. How successful have your members been at going about negotiating with the insurer and getting an agreed upon contract text? And you're directing that question to Kim? Yeah, she has the, the most membership, I think, of the group. Okay. Kim? Sure. So uh, most of the insurance companies do not have favorable contracts for ambulance providers. And I think that was spoken yesterday in one of the presentations. Um, our experience is if we reach out to the commercial insurance plans, most of the time the, the negotiation is that we'll pay you at the Medicare allowed amount or we'll pay you a very small rate above the Medicare approved, uh, approved amount. And that just is, it's not favorable to the ambulance providers based on the cost um, that, it, that it, it takes to um, run an ambulance service, so. No, that's the, that's the answer that I expected is sort of unfair negotiation. So thank you for confirming. Any other questions from the committee? We have about another three minutes if you do or not. Um, I think this came up and I'm going to ask maybe Sean in your presentation, you talked about on the private space, there's not, uh, it's basically fees. So Pete, I want to ask a question of you. You mentioned that in Oceanside, um, that there is a, the cost of providing services really not coming from the payer side of it. What is that percentage that you are having to offset um, in Oceanside based upon what I call other costs or other funds that you mentioned? It, it, actually, I, I, I want to make it clear that the majority of the cost is being reimbursed by the providers. We're probably in the 65, 66% range um, that we are getting reimbursed. Uh, so I don't want it to be out there that, that the governments are subsidizing, you know, more than 50% in my case, uh, because we're roughly at about 66% reimbursement um, for, the, uh, for the, the EMS program, you know, 60 to 66%, somewhere in that vicinity. Okay, so it's not a majority then. It sounds to me like you're getting about 60% or more from the, the payers and the others being subsidized by these other funds. Correct. Okay. And Sean, to your point, I'm assuming what you indicated about on, uh, on, on your presentation that there were little subsidization. Is that what your presentation presented? Yeah, I mean, none of the none of the services that I work with have any subsidy at all, although I am familiar with within the private sector, there are some communities that offer a limited amount of subsidy to be able to keep a provider in place. So I don't want to say it categorically doesn't exist. Okay. And then uh, any other questions from the committee? If not, I've got one more. I've got several actually, but I'll do one more and then we will turn this back over to Tara to move to the next. Any other from the committee? If not, this goes back to you, Pete. Um, you mentioned in your presentation, you state an ALS engine responds. For my clarification, can you tell me, is that an actual, in my layman's terms, because I don't know anything about the fire service side of actually running on an engine, is that a fire engine or a fire truck? Or is that like a sprinter unit or something like that that you are sending out when you talk about the ALS engine response? An, uh, an ALS engine is an ALS fire engine. So it's a multitask unit. A truck is normally a ladder truck. It's got a, la a ladder on top. So an ALS engine, and, and I saw the question about the assessment fee. We bill the assessment fee to the patient unless they give us insurance information. Obviously with Medicare, it has to be billed as a, uh, as a service that we know, you know is, is GY modifier. Yeah. It's non-billable. <laughs> And that's the hundred dollar fee that you that you mentioned as well in your presentation, correct? Yes, sir. And how did you guys come up with that hundred dollar fee? Um, frankly, it was directed by the uh, city administration that we had to charge a 
a fee for the response to cover the dispatch costs and everything else. Our dispatch costs are about $65 a, a response uh, because of our JPA and then uh, everything else associated with it. And they told us to do $100. That was basically- okay, and, that was, and you were regulated by your elected officials in your local jurisdiction. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Charge, okay. We're a tool All right. Fantastic, Pete, great presentations. Kim, great presentations. I really appreciate you guys coming and talking to us about that. Um, if we have more questions, I'm hoping you guys hang around. We'll get to them. If not, I'm sure we'll be calling you back for a subject matter expert as well. Tara, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you. Next up, we have Andrew McKahey and Maria Durham who will present us with an overview of the Medicare Ground Ambulance Data Collection System. Thanks, Tara. Um, I'll just dive right into this presentation. I know you've heard from um, Maria on a couple other occasions during this meeting. Um, I'm Andrew Mulcahy. I'm a health policy researcher and health economist at the RAND Corporation. RAND's a nonprofit research organization that's been supporting CMS over the past few years now to first develop and then implement now uh, we're at the start of analyzing some data out of the Medicare ground ambulance data collection system, um, which I'll refer to today by its catchy acronym, GADCS. Um, I will, uh, before going in, just uh, mention that RAN continues to work with CMS um, under contract on this work. Um, I will review some general slides on the GADCS today um, anything I might say otherwise, though, uh, is my own opinion and not CMS's um, uh, position from CMS. So next slide, please. The very high level overview. So what is the GADCS? Um, there's a requirement from Congress to collect information on cost, revenue, and other information from representative samples of ground ambulance organizations. So in Medicare, there's a distinction between providers of services, it's hospitals and, and other Medicare providers of services, and suppliers, uh, which is the bulk of organizations that provide ground ambulance services. I'll just refer to them collectively as organizations today, um, but recognize the important distinction um, in terms of other Medicare requirements and enrollment and all of that. Um, to meet this requirement, uh, CMS developed the GADCS. And we talk about the GADCS in a cohesive kind of singular way at, at this point, very holistically, but under the hood, there are a couple of different components that evolved at different times. You know, the first to meet the requirement from uh, Congress for representative samples. There's a, a detailed sampling approach that CMS followed outlined in an earlier report that's posted up on their uh, GADCS website and then formalized in, in, in in rulemaking, um, where there are four cohorts of, of ground ambulance organizations selected in consecutive years that collectively cover almost the entire industry. So 10,000 plus ground ambulance organizations, roughly 2,500 uh, organizations a year. That selection process, the sampling, and all of the rest of the process, notification, data collection, data reporting that I'll talk about in a bit, is all done at the national provider ID or NPI level. So that's part one. Part two is a set of questions. The questions that CMS asks those selected organizations so that the CMS will collect all of the information that, that Congress laid out on cost, revenue, utilization, other information. Um, that also up on that uh, CMS's GADCS website is a uh, set of uh, questions in PDF format that anyone can look at. I'll briefly review the content of the instrument towards the end of my comments today. And then the last piece is a web-based portal that selected organizations will actually use to report the information to CMS. That is now up and running. Um, for year one and year two organizations, the first two of those four cohorts I mentioned, those organizations are now able to get in and um, uh, for many of those organizations actually report information to CMS. So next slide, please. Just taking maybe one step back on why this information is important. My guess is that uh, during other presentations during this meeting, 
um, you know, the fact that we we probably wish from a policymaker's perspective, we knew more about the ground ambulance organizations um, operating out there. Um, there's a dearth of information here that, you know, there are some studies um, by some folks on, on uh, the call right now um, using claims data, which is important, but incomplete to get a sense for the information on what services are actually provided, what costs are involved in furnishing those services and what revenue ground ambulance organizations are, are taking in. And so uh, you know, this is uh, you know, a data collection system that's going to shine some light on the cost and revenue um, involved uh, in actually providing ground ambulance services. The ultimate goal for this information goes to CMS first, but the ultimate use is uh, to send information to MedPAC, which Congress required to uh, conduct a study of that information, focusing primarily on the adequacy of Medicare payments for ground ambulance services. So that's the, 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 the ob objective of this initial round of data collection is to bring the information in and then it will go to MedPAC so they can analyze it and form a set of recommendations to Congress on Medicare payment rates. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'll go through uh, uh, those three components, the sampling, uh, the questions, and the reporting in a little more detail over the next few slides. Uh, a word first on sampling and selecting. Yeah. Ambulance organizations, as everyone on this call knows, are, are, are differ on many important dimensions. And through the initial development work in the GADCS, reaching out and talking to many of those different types of organizations, it uh, became really clear that to get a representative sample, it was important to purposefully make sure that CMS is covering that wide range, that heterogeneity in ground ambulance organizations. And one of the first steps was to lay out the key dimensions that 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 we, CMS, others can can use to categorize ground ambulance organizations using claims data and other administrative data. Those dimensions are baked into that table on the right, which represents the sampling strata or the different levels of sampling that we combined to pull these random representative samples. Um, what, at a very basic level, whether or not they're providers or suppliers, as I mentioned earlier, is the first cut. What kind of ownership arrangement the organization has, whether it's government, for-profit, nonprofit, uh, the volume of services provided, so that's split in the sampling scheme into four categories, low, which is very low, medium, high, or very high. It's a long uh, right tail in this distribution where a very small number of MPIs provide a very large share of total Medicare transports. So it was important to differentiate on that dimension. And then finally, where the organizations operate. So we have a set of urban uh, uh, service areas, rural and super rural. There were some changes in the timeline for when year one through year four organizations were selected due to the public health emergency. Some of the dates uh, were pushed, pushed back a bit, um, but there still are now on that CMS GADCS website, four separate lists of NPIs, each with 2,500 plus individual MPIs on them without any duplication across the years. So each NPI must just collect and report once through this initial process. Um, and then again, collectively, they sum up to roughly 10,500 total organizations participating across these four years. You can see just eyeballing the where the, the number of MPIs fall in this chart on the right. Um, that there are some combinations of these four factors that get down to pretty small uh, totals here, like 20, 27 super rural, high or very high nonprofit suppliers. Um, so, you know, the goal is to get um, uh, as, as good coverage as is possible across all of these different categories of organizations. And then once the data is in, to address for any kind of differential non-response across these categories so that the results when they go to MedPAC are generalizable. I'm gonna to apply to the entire industry. Next slide, please. 
So a quick overview of the process here. There's a uh, uh, first stage for selection, as I mentioned. CMS is pulling random samples. CMS then directly and through contractors, including its administrative contractors, notifies the selected organizations that they've been selected. Those organizations then collect data over a 12 month period where they're not reporting any information to CMS, but they're tallying up all of their services, their expenses, revenue, keeping uh, in many cases, track of data they already keep track of for billing purposes or for other reports. Um, in many cases, it's minor tweaks to information that organizations already collect that need to happen to get to the full set of information that CMS is requiring. So that's what we call the data collection period. There's then a data reporting period, and that's where we are now for some of the year one and year two organizations where they've already collected their full year of data. And now as a one-time activity, they're going into the CMS portal and entering their information and then certifying that it is complete and accurate, sending that into CMS. Next slide, please. This is a, a snapshot of some of the general instructions from GADCS. As I mentioned before, if you'd like to read through all of the instructions, um, they are up there in a PDF in English and Spanish on CMS's website. Um, you know, the scope for GADCS, which is clear throughout all of the instructions, is broad. It's not just expenses or revenue associated with Medicare. It's all ground ambulance activity in terms of the total cost of operation, regardless of whether there's payment at the end of that track for a given activity or not, the total scope of ground ambulance expenses and the total scope of ground ambulance revenue. And that means not just revenue from billed transports, but also money from uh, government entities, tax, tax earmarks, that kind of thing. So it's very holistic in terms of the scope here. Um, it is important to remember, too, that this is over an entire 12-month period. So it's not specifically focusing on the payment for any one service, any one transport. It is an aggregate amount that's being tallied over that entire 12-month period and then reported to CMS in that one number representing the entire 12-month expense or revenue across all of those activities. This uh, set of questions, as you'll see if you flip through or flip through later uh, after, after this presentation, um, does get into some detail. And it gets into the detail that's necessary to break out what is a ground ambulance expense versus what is not, and to deal with that heterogeneity in organizations, that there are huge differences between a super rural uh, government organization versus a, a, a large for-profit organization or a, a Medicare provider of service, a hospital-based ground ambulance provider. And so there are questions that, that ask for information that in some cases uh, CMS recognizes would, would entail a great burden to put together. So there are some questions where estimates are explicitly allowed um, balancing that need to understand the differences under the hood versus the burden on ground ambulance organizations. In general, ground ambulance organizations have the flexibility to use basically whatever accounting approach they use already to report information to the GADCS rather than impose some set of requirements along the lines of a cost report, which the GADCS is definitely not. Uh, next slide, please. Over the entire set of questions, there are 13 sections. Uh, the first few get at organizational characteristics. Uh, the next two deal with the services, the volume and mix of services provided. The next several sections deal with expenses, and then section 13 covers revenue. So next slide, please. I'll go through each of these in a little more detail. Uh, section two on organizational characteristics asks for information that's necessary to categorize each MPI and then to determine what questions need to be asked of that MPI down the road. 
This is one way to reduce burden rather than having everyone go through the same set of questions, half of which might be not applicable to a given organization. The system reads off of these initial responses. And if you say you're fire department based, you're gonna get questions later on asking about that. You say you're part of a broader organization that owns and operates multiple MPIs billing for ground ambulance services, you're gonna see questions relevant to that. Otherwise, you're not gonna see them. The idea that that will cut down the total time and burden for each individual organization. Uh, volunteer labor is another great example of this, where uh, it was a whole whole section on volunteer labor. Um, it pops up for um, those with volunteers and doesn't for others. Next slide, please. Sections three and four get a uh, service area and emergency response time. Service area, CMS already has somewhat of a handle on from uh, information reported via claims but very important to get the organization's own sense of what its service area is. I heard the tail end of uh, uh, the prior presentation um, talking about the potential service area for for-profit organizations and how that uh, you know, could, could be quite broad in some cases. So uh, there's uh, a, a lot of flexibility that organizations have to report where they're operating. Also have some important questions around emergency response time for organizations responding to emergency calls for service. Next slide, please. Five and six get at service volume and service mix. So this is the number of uh, services at many different points in the process here. And there's a recognition that um, many responses don't translate into transports, not all transports translate into paid transports. Um, and so there's an accounting along the way to get at the total number of responses first, and then kind of trickle down to the number of paid transports at the end of that process. There's also in section six questions about the mix of those services. So of all those transports, of all those responses, what's the mix between emergency versus non-emergency? For those that are billed and paid, what's the mix across HICPIC codes, et cetera. Next slide, please. Section seven through 12 report uh, expenses. So uh, labor, which uh, previous studies, including those by the GAO found are you know, roughly two thirds of the total expenses associated with ground ambulance operations, um, facilities, vehicles, equipment and supplies, and then a section 11 for basically everything else so that the total of these amounts reported across sections seven through 11 equal the total expense, total ground ambulance expenses for that organization during the year. Next slide, please. And maybe if you don't, I, there's some animation here, but don't mind just clicking through so that it's all up on the screen. Thank you. I think that's probably it. And, you know, one really important point for, for, the roughly half of organizations that do something beyond ground ambulance. Um, you know, there are many uh, first response organizations that are fire ambulance, some police, um, other public safety roles. Uh, we have providers of services too that, that are part of a broader hospital or healthcare delivery system. You know, one challenging but necessary step here instead of instructions is for those organizations to, to use some approach to carve out a share of their expenses and revenue that's related to ground ambulance versus not. And I think, you know, this has historically been a real challenge. Prior GAO surveys have uh, excluded fire ambulance departments combined um, because of this challenge uh, of, of uh, splitting around, splitting out those shared expenses so that there's some share for a fire engine transporting paramedics to the scene or a facility that houses both uh, fire engines and ambulances. Um, there's the need to split that expense up. And so there are many instructions on how to do this in the instrument itself, also a wide range of other resources that CMS has made available to try to give some pointers for doing this. Um, there is no one approach that CMS is requiring. Again, it's not a cost uh, cost report kind of vibe for the GADCS, but there are instructions on how crucial it is to carefully think through these shared expenses 
and um, report them, uh, report just a ground ambulance share or report the necessary information for the system itself to calculate a ground ambulance specific share of that expense. Next slide, please. Revenue is the last section in the GADCS and covers revenue from transports by payer at the start, and then also all other sources of revenue related to ground ambulance. So that's, uh, you know, for, for some municipal uh, uh, government-based organizations, that uh, revenue is going to be partially from uh, from payers via paid transport claims, and then part or even the majority of financial support is going to be coming from somewhere else. You know, as many of these organizations are, are the, have this broader first response uh, role in their communities, and that's very important. Different communities have different uh, requirements, different objectives out of setting up those services. And so we want to make sure to capture all of that and also some information about what the specifics are around response times and the balance between fire and ambulance responses. Um, so Section 13 does, like the rest of the GADCS, broadly get at the total amount that uh, is related to ground ambulance services. There's also one question in Section 13 which asks for total revenue across all activities, including, say, fire. Next slide, please. Uh, got this and then just one more quick wrap up slide. Um, I mentioned before this CMS GADCS website, there's many information, many different documents with information for those of you who would like a deeper dive, including that specific set of questions. There's now a GADCS user guide, which is what uh, CMS is pointing organizations to to read through the as they go through and actually enter information. A lot of helpful tips there if you're associated with an organization that actually has to do has to do this data reporting, um, I'd suggest you check out that user guide. There's an FAQ, tip sheets, webinars, and many other educational uh, resources up on that website. And I think that's, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Pleasure to present that overview of the GADCS. Thank you, Andrew. Next up, we have Adam Beck who will discuss the disclosure of charges to consumers and the role of essential health benefits. Thanks and good morning. Um, this will be, I think, a fairly brief portion um, covering these, these two basic topics on the role of EHBs. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the role of uh, different documents, such as the summary benefits and coverage. Um, and I'll mention then EOBs, which uh, we've uh, referenced uh, at least by the acronym uh, a few times this morning already. I don't have a photo of that, um, but I do want to talk about EOBs, uh, which would come after the service. So we've got kind of pre-service notification or disclosure of charges and post-service notification. Um, so starting with essential health benefits, if we can go to the next slide. So essential health benefits are 10 categories of services uh, that are required to be covered by individual and small group health insurance plans uh, that were established under the Affordable Care Act in 2010. Um, within these categories, we then look to state benchmark plans, which will determine what specific services are considered essential health benefits within these categories. But generally speaking, these are the 10 categories that then would include a multitude of services under each of these categories. The 10 listed on the screen, I won't list through all of them, but would just call your attention to the first two ambulatory patient services and emergency services. Um, and it will be under one of these two categories that the EMS or the ground ambulance transportation that we've talked about, the remote healthcare uh, and emergency services would be covered as uh, essential health benefits, again, in the individual or, or small group market. We can go to the next slide. As I mentioned, this is on a fairly small, um, but not insignificant uh, proportion of total uh, commercial health insurance plans that are required to cover benefits within the 10 EHB categories. There are some impacts, and I mentioned this uh, as an aside yesterday, there are some impacts for a uh, large group and self-funded health plans, um, but the actual requirement to look at, all right, must this plan provide, say, ground ambulance services as a matter of law, as opposed to as a matter of kind of policy or market-based principle, 
that's going to apply only to non-grandfathered individual market and small group market plans, oftentimes referred to a little bit erroneously as ACA plans, um, given that, you know, I, I kind of take a little bit of issue with uh, using that moniker just because the ACA is much, much broader than just the individual or small group market. Um, but the, the EHB requirement under Section 1302 of the Affordable Care Act is going to strictly apply to those types of plans. One of the main reasons that this advisory committee then has um, a clear role in making recommendations for a federal solution here is because ERISA self-funded uh, group health plans cover about 110 million Americans, and they're not going to be subject to either state insurance laws or to the requirement to cover services within the 10 essential health benefit categories. However, I would note that one, most self-funded group health plans provide coverage for ambulance transportation. In fact, I would say nearly all, um, if not all. I think you would be hard pressed to find a large self-funded employer that is not going to, um, through their uh, employee health benefits, cover ground ambulance transportation. Um, we can certainly debate the, the level of coverage or the reimbursement rates. And I know that's you know a, a lot of the, the future work of this committee is I think to land on uh, recommendations around what constitutes a reasonable um, and a market-based uh, reimbursement amount, but the coverage itself is generally speaking in almost all instances going to be there in large group and in self-funded group health plans. Um, but the fact that they are not subject to state insurance laws goes back to this uh, slide with the map that I pulled up yesterday afternoon, noting that you only have 10 states that have any sort of balanced billing protections uh, that apply to ground ambulances. And because of uh, the role of ERISA in preempting state insurance laws, um, we really do need federal action here uh, to make sure that patients are protected in cases of ground ambulance transportation or EMS services. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, uh, very brief, uh, and uh, wanted to talk about both pre-service and post-service disclosure of charges uh, to consumers about what they either could expect to pay if they were to be transported via ambulance, um, and that's going to be in advance to the summary of benefits and coverage. And then I mentioned after the fact, we've all probably uh, received and are quite familiar with after any time we've, you know, whether it's through ground ambulance transportation or um, just going to our primary care provider, going to the ER, um, seeing a specialist, we then may get and may or may not look at that explanation of benefits that we get after the fact. Um, but before they would receive a service, the Affordable Care Act requires all plans uh, to have this pretty standard looking document. Um, and I've, with the, uh, the red oval here circled at the top where you would look for um, the sort of plain language uh, descriptions that will lay out if you need immediate medical attention, such as through emergency medical transportation. In this particular hypothetical plan, uh, it would note that if you see an a in-network provider, a contracted provider for emergency medical transportation uh, under this plan, that would be a $100 copay per visit. Um, and that happens under this plan to be a $100 copay for, per visit as well for an out-of-network provider. Um, and then in the uh, fifth column over here on the right, a note about limitations, exceptions, and other important information. And this notes that out-of-network uh, coverage is only going to be covered for emergencies. And a lot of this then turns back um, to some of the discussion that we had yesterday about how are we defining emergencies um, and what standard is going to be used to determine whether or not when you called 911, that service constituted an emergency. And if you're then, um, as would be most likely, going to um, be seen and, and be transported by an out-of-network emergency provider, then that definition, that standard is going to be critically important. Um, slide, uh, unfortunately, is missing here that would show the after, uh, after the situation explanation, and that's going to be the EOB, the explanation of benefits, um, which is going to be in, in a, I'd say, a similar looking document in the sense of they usually then look, kind of had the same blue and, uh, and white box text here. Um, and that's instead of using uh, written description is going to then lay out the charges and lay out the code, the HCPCS code or the CPT code for your date of service and the description of what service was rendered, the charges, the provider responsibility, the allowed amount, and then detail the patient's non-covered amount, um, any other insurance, uh, workers' comp, um, any other uh, government benefits that may be applied 
what the deductible is for your particular plan if you have one, um, and then direct it to the consumer what your copay amount is or your coinsurance amount, what amount was actually paid, and then the number that most folks are looking for and jump to at the end, which is the amount that you owe. Um, and that's going to be the final amount um, of the total charge that you are going to be responsible for um, as the insured individual. It's, you will usually say at the top of an EOB that this is not a bill. The bill is going to come separately and there may be negotiations or there may be um, discussions in between what you see on the explanation of benefits and actually receiving a bill from the provider um, in which we could then see, I know this has been in the comments throughout, situations where there are adjustments or there are discounts um, that either the carrier may um, may offer or that the provider, the county uh, or the EMS provider uh, may end up discounting something and that may either reduce or eliminate uh, ultimately the amount that the consumer owes. Um, so that's going to be something that shows up on the EOB as opposed to what is here on the screen, which is the summary of benefits and coverage. So those are two pretty different uh, categories that we threw into to one presentation about the role of essential health benefits and then disclosures to consumers, um, both of which are required under the Affordable Care Act um, and may reach either directly your plan if you are in an individual or small group plan uh, governed by the Affordable Care Act um, or may still be standard practice if you are in, as most folks are, through job-based coverage in a large group or a self-funded group health plan. So ASBL, I will with that, like I said, fairly brief, can turn it back to you. Thank you, Adam. Next, we will have Steve Worth and Doug Wolfberg, who will present on amulets and EMS responsibilities for disclosure. Good morning, everybody. Glad to be with you this morning. And our topic is short as well. We're talking about disclosures. And when we say disclosures, we're primarily talking about disclosures of rates and charges to the uh, patients, which of course, as we all know, is a very important aspect of the No Surprises Act. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> That's nice. And But what's unique about EMS is we're so different than the rest of healthcare. We don't have ward clerks. We don't have registration staff. We don't have the four walls of a building to protect us. We're dealing with very hectic situations, uncontrolled environments, Patients are often upset, in distress, even in the non-emergency setting, and we got limited time with the patients. And we got a box here in the back where you could maybe fit one or two people in there, and we just have the mission of focusing on the patient and the patient care in that limited time. So it's very difficult in an ambulance to provide any type of, of notices to the patient because we just don't have that uh, availability of the support staff and so forth. So forth. Next slide, please trying to move this along quickly. And this is just some examples of the environment we're working in. And a lot of uh, the healthcare laws and regulations and policies, unfortunately, are written not with this in mind. They're written with the in mind the traditional healthcare uh, situations and healthcare providers like hospitals and so forth that we see. Next slide, please. So to simplify it, it comes down to really three different aspects of or points where you can give notice to the patient about your charges or costs. And advance notice, of course, is giving it to them ahead of time, ahead of the service. Well, obviously, you can't do that in a 911 situation. You can't have a patient or family member screaming and, hey, I need help. My husband's laying there on the, on the, on the floor. And then, you know, say, oh, let's give you the notice about how much this is going to cost, ma'am. You can't do that. No way. Uh, where it's often occurring is in the non-emergency setting where there's good call intake procedures at the dispatch center, where if it's a transport, for example, where there will be a cost to the patient uh, as opposed to their insurance, et cetera, giving that information ahead of time is the only place we really see this notice being effective because certainly that point of service isn't the time to do it. And retroactive notice, well, the ship has sailed at that point in terms of the effectiveness of that notice and uh, we don't uh, see too much of that happening except in the form of the summary of benefits as was just mentioned and so forth. Next slide, please. So in terms of the actual requirements under the law, there aren't many, quite frankly. Uh, federal law under Medicare requires an advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage in very limited circumstances in areas where you have the, uh, the provider believes that the service is not going to be covered. 
by Medicare. And then there may be an obligation to provide the patient an upfront notice. Clearly, that's very limited in the ambulance setting. Uh, most other federal programs outside of Medicare have no express requirement at all. And basically, we're talking about only non-emergent situations where the Medicare ABN uh, is required. It's very rare that it is required, and it is, again, only in the non-emergency uh, setting, which fortunately CMS has recognized that you can't give these notices in an emergency situation. Next slide, please. So essentially, there's only three uh, specific areas where an ABN may be required, is required to give to the patient before you can bill the patient for a non-covered service. And the main one we deal with is basically in the skilled nursing facility setting, where a patient is in a sniff, and now the staff decides, oh, the patient needs suturing, the patient needs a blood draw, uh, let's get an ambulance and get them to the hospital emergency department for that. Well, the government recognizes skilled nursing facility, they're supposed to do those things there, so now it's going to cost the pro program a lot more money to take them to uh, a, a facility to have that done outside of that SNF. So in that situation, an ABN is required. The other two examples where there's a downgrade, they call it a downgrade from advanced life support to basic life support, or a downgrade from air to ground, we just don't see those from a practical standpoint, because those would be situations when a patient says, hey, I don't care if I don't need advanced life support ambulance, I want one, okay? Or, hey, I'd like to fly in a helicopter instead of being in a ground ambulance, I want that service. Essentially, that's the only cases we see where uh, an ABN would be uh, provided to a patient, and it's extremely rare. So it's mostly the SNF situation where the patient's being sent out for services that could be more economically performed at the skilled nursing facility. Now, we advocate using uh, ABNs on a voluntary basis for excess mileage, transporting the patient to a facility uh, beyond the nearest appropriate facility, long distance transport, or when we know it's not medically necessary, that sort of thing. So sometimes we uh, will we'll, uh, use the ABN on a voluntary basis. But in terms of federal rules, uh, uh, basically rare uh, occasions where uh, advanced notice is uh, required to be provided to the patient. Next slide, please. Okay, state law requirements. Is this mine or yours? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Next uh, so we talk about state law. That's even more <laughs> limited than uh, federal requirements. Uh, you got to look to the state Medicaid programs. Everyone is different in terms of what they require in terms of an advance notice to the patient before the patient can be billed for non-covered service. It's typically very difficult to bill a Medicaid patient for non-covered service. The notice requirements are pretty strict there in the state Medicaid programs. There's only a few states that actually uh, regulate or require, I should say, any kind of notice or setting of rates. Like the setting of rates, we'll start with that. Only three states are involved in rate setting. Uh, only one state that we're aware of requires approval of ambulance rates. And, uh, you know, very few requirements that we could find where there's actual state law requirements to provide a, a patient with notice of the fees and the costs associated with uh, ambulance service. And in terms of balanced billing laws, well, yes, a number of states have implemented their own mini No Surprise Act uh, laws, but many of those actually uh, exempt out ambulance service or only include ambulance service in those NSA laws on a very limited basis. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Doug, to get in a little more Thanks. Specifics. Next slide, please. Thank you. So a quick example, Pennsylvania, where we're sitting right now or standing, uh, on the Medicaid side does have a similar ABN type of requirement in cases where determination is made in advance of service that it won't be covered. Again, that only applies to non-emergent situations. Next slide, please. Uh, as Steve mentioned, three states that require um, that rate set and then one that requires approval of rates. Um, only one of those requires a posting. I think many of the states do post approved rates or the providers do. They may do that voluntarily as well. Um, but in New Mexico, as we mentioned, that the state handles the publication of those approved rates. Next slide, please. Uh, these states that are listed have state uh, balanced billing prohibitions. Um, 
only one has a requirement that we found that applies to uh, disclosures. Um, and I think that one is on the insurer side, as Adam was talking about um, as well. Next slide, please. So one uh, point that we do want to talk about is that at the local level, uh, there are some requirements for disclosures of certain types at the local level. This may be rate setting or disclosures of rates. Um, in some areas, a city council, for example, or a county commission may pass or enact a local ordinance that has rate restrictions for both emergency and non-emergency ambulance charges. No central database, not like you can go to Lexis or you know search it. Uh, that is a, a little bit more of a haphazard way to sort of collect that information. But anecdotally, we're aware of a number of them because we work with clients in those kinds of systems. Next slide, please. Uh, now, in addition to the ordinances and resolutions, in many areas, there are contracts between ambulance services and local governments. Those contracts may constitute another layer of regulation of charges and disclosures to consumers in certain cases. Again, because it's city by city, anecdotally, we believe most contracts do not contain disclosure requirements. Most do not contain rate setting, but there are some in that context where you might find those requirements as well. Also, in some states, there's a unique process where ambulance services are contracted through a competitive procurement process a request for proposals. And sometimes you see restrictions and requirements in the RFPs that the bidding providers would then agree to by submission of a proposal. Next slide, please. Um, and Steve sort of teed, teed this issue up, but you know, oftentimes we see a reluctance to have these kinds of requirements. We think that reluctance is justified because as Steve said, the, the pre-hospital environment, particularly the emergency care environment is so, uh, unique. We don't want to send a message of deterring people from getting care when it's necessary. Of course, we know there are times when people utilize EMS when it's not necessary. Systems are evolving to address that. But, you know, there's a concern about, you know, dissuading a patient from getting care by having that discussion of costs prematurely in an emergent situation. There's also, you know, limited contact time, which I think is another concern that has to be addressed. Next slide, please. Um, you know, another distinction that we just want to make here quickly is that if a person comes into a physician's office or a hospital, there are often dedicated administrative personnel that handle registration, get the form signed, do the paperwork, and all of, you know, verify insurance. In the ambulance setting, the clinicians are the sole individuals that they'll come in contact with. So they are the clinicians, the insurance people, you know, they do all of those things, and they don't typically have uh, a good sense of the billing, the coverage, the reimbursement, the notice rules, and that kind of stuff, because we're talking about providers without administrative support, as you would find in other care settings. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so another thing we wanted to point out is that because much utilization of EMS is done via 911, there's very limited patient information that can be gathered even for an advanced type of notice. The first set of eyes that we have on the patient is when the caregivers arrive at the patient's side, uh, when service is already in process, uh, because there's usually not enough information at the time of the call to determine whether a coverage decision can be made. We just want to note one other thing, that where ambulances are owned and operated by hospitals, so they're provider-based, uh, EMTALA has been interpreted to uh, essentially prohibit disclosures of charges prior to the required medical screening examination, which of course cannot be done by the EMS practitioners, only folks in the hospital, usually physicians, are the only ones credentialed to provide the statutory medical screening examination. So that's a factor we wanted to mention as well. Uh, and then on the non-emergency side, the decision to utilize an ambulance is not made by the ambulance. It's made by facilities who want to move the patient or other practitioners. So the access to that pre-call information is also limited. Uh, next slide, please. That is it. Uh, so we want to thank the committee, thank Asbel and the rest of you for uh, giving us a brief opportunity to chat. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Asbel for committee and public feedback for session two.
So thank you to everyone. And I know we've got a lot of questions. And um, since I'm chair, I'm going to ask a question really quick. I know there's a lot of dialogue just for you that are dialoguing in the comment section. There seems to be a lot around um, the Medicare to cost shifting on Medicaid Advantage or Medicare Advantage. That will be extremely explored when we get into some of the subcommittees as well. But thank you to our presenters on this. One thing I wanted a clarification on, and this is going to go to Doug and Steve on their presentations. Um, there were several presentations already today that were talking about rates being set in Pete Lawrence's and Oceanside to Kim Stanley's and some of the data that they showed. Doug, you mentioned the statement on one of your slides that on the contracts or provisions that most um, that you're aware of in your experience did not see something around rates. Can you please expound on that for me and the committee? Sure, happy to. Uh, this is based on our point of view. So our observation and the client engagements that we do around the country, I would say in certain pockets of the country, you do more often see rate, uh, rate uh, considerations within contracts, RFPs or ordinances. More out West is where we tend to see that, less in the East. That's a broad generalization, but uh, some municipalities do look at that as a consumer protection. That's debatable because, you know, as we know, the self-pay portion of a payer mix is really the smallest. So, you know, the concern is those charges can artificially limit, uh, you know, the ability to recover adequate costs from across the payer spectrum um, when it's kind of misseen as a consumer protection. But that so it's anecdotal uh, as bell but it's it's hit or miss uh we see it more often in certain geographic pockets of the country less often in others i don't know if that uh answered your question but happy to follow just, up. that was just an interesting dynamic through that any data around that would be very helpful to the committee based upon um some of that discussion as well but thanks for that clarification um Doug, i appreciate it um, let me go to Dr. Ritu first, and then I'm going to go to Dr. G uh, or to Dr. Gary to Gary, but Dr. Ritu Sani. I don't know if you want to insult Gary that way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, yeah, this question is for Andrew. Um, I appreciated the the um, overview of the survey methodology, et cetera. One of the things that was of concern, um, particularly for us in the medical direction world, was that, this, that that methodology would sort of grossly um, undercount the uh, impact and cost of medical oversight. And to use my own uh, experience as, a, as an example, um, our, our providers in the two counties that I'm the medical director for uh, have by law have to have me as the medical director. So poor Sean didn't get to choose, um, but um, my the cost of providing that medical direction is paid for by the county. So while if if Sean is one of the agencies filling out the survey, they would talk about a fee that they're paying to the county. Nowhere would the would the cost of medical oversight and uh, be be sort of showing up as a cost to the system. Yeah, it's a great point, and um, I didn't touch on this specifically in my comments, but there are about three different occasions in the instrument where organizations could put could report expenses related to to, to medical direction uh, medical oversight and um, there, there are there are a couple of um FAQ entries a couple of instructions that provide guidance to organizations on how to handle expenses uh borne by an organization other than their their actual organization their MPI and there are many cases where uh, for a municipal government, um, owned, operated ground ambulance organizations say where the separate ambulance budget, if it exists, probably excludes a great, great many important expenses to actually operating that ambulance service. But the uh, HR and IT and vehicle maintenance and fuel and everything out dispatch may be handled somewhere else in the municipal government's uh, accounting. So the instructions there are to include that. Um, you know, if if that broader entity uh, was like the count, a county government say was responsible for for covering medical direction, then it would be included as a direct expense. But otherwise, if it's outside of those bounds and it's another organization entirely, a, a, a county government providing uh, medical oversight and the organization itself is uh, for profit, 
uh, organization, say, or, or a, a, a narrower municipal government-based organization, that fee they pay would be recorded, but you're right, it would not be explicitly linked to medical direction if it is a broader fee. Um, so yeah, many opportunities for that expense to get in and the instructions are very clear that the expense needs to be there. The extent to which it's easy though, to link that up to medical direction and medical oversight will vary. And it's you know one area where, because of all of the different arrangements out there to, to, to secure and then compensate, for, for medical oversight that's kind of show up in the instrument and in the collected data in different ways for different organizations. Thanks, Andrew, for that. I'm going to get to Gary. Hey, thanks. I have a question for Medicare or Rand or both. And then as Bill, I'd like to make a very, very short statement after the question is answered. Would it be fair to say that Medicare is uh, not paying Rand anything or a very tiny amount because Rand is using volunteer professionals to do this work. Uh, on on Rand side, that is not uh, that's not the case. There's a contractual arrangement in place. For okay, so Rand. my short statement is what you can't get professionals to do this work as volunteers. None of which, by the way, are going to make any split second decisions about whether or not a patient lives or dies. Okay, you can move on as well. Okay, so I think I see what uh, Gary was was making a point here. Thank you so much, Andrew. I appreciate that. Um, Patricia. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I had a question from um, the tag team on the disclosures. Um, I know you focus primarily on like the billing disclosures and what people would pay, but I'm curious, did you do any collection around um, disclosures of patients' medical rights, like um, is there any disclosure with the sending of the bill, for example, that if you're a Medicare or Medicaid patient, you shouldn't have to pay a balanced bill or how to access the ambulance's financial assistance program if there is one or how to challenge a bill. Is there, could you talk a little bit about that kind of disclosure if you did any looking at that? Who was your question for Patricia? Was this for Doug and Steve? I'm sorry, go ahead, Doug and Steve. Yeah, happy to, to comment on it. No specific requirements under the law that we're aware of, but we do know of some ambulance services that have a patient bill of rights, much like hospitals do. Sometimes they may distribute that. They may have that on their website in terms of how to handle questions or concerns about their billing, uh, that sort of thing. There's also in the assignment of benefit statement that ambulance services are expected to obtain uh, comments there in, in terms of what uh, how, how bill is being handled, that it's being submitted and payment will be made to the provider and that sort of thing. Uh, and oftentimes there may be uh, points there for questions if necessary. HIPAA also requires some disclosures, of course, of uh, notice of privacy practices as well, which can be given at the time of service or posted on a website and so forth. So no requirements, but some ambulance services, but we don't have a good number on that. Uh, may provide some additional information to patients about their rights. Doug, you want to add to that? No, good, good answer. I, th I think it'd be just great, like anybody out there who's doing like what they consider a best practice for helping patients understand their bill and understand their rights, I, I would love to see that. Perfect. We will make note of that as well. Um, great, great question there, Patricia. Uh, Rhonda. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the presentations. And my question is for Andrew, as far as the um, data collection system, has there been uh, analysis of the data and what is that showing so far? Great question, Rhonda. The way that the timing works out, the earliest uh, that an organization could have to start that first 12 month of data collection was January 1 of last year. And so that that first, the earliest end of that year would have been December 31st of last year. And then organizations have five months to actually report the information to CMS. So there are a, um, a smattering of responses already in, um, but uh, not surprisingly, maybe uh, folks seem to be waiting towards that uh, end of that five month uh, period, which will come up in just a few weeks. So yeah. the information's coming in, there's been no um, formal analysis of the of the data at this point. 
And we were one of the lucky ones chosen. So congratulations. <laughs> Rhonda. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rhonda. And I'm going to go to Ted. I see your hands raised. Thanks, Asbel. Appreciate all the uh, presentations and content this morning. I have two questions for two different groups, if I could. First is for um, Steve and Doug. Um, obviously, I have some familiarity. I noticed Arizona was left off on the rate setting and um, can you provide me any understanding you have on how they're set up as far as every CON having uh, state regulated rates by mileage and base rates, then also their annual auditing process of financials? Yeah, we do. We do mention uh, Arizona, actually, as as one of those states. It was on uh, slide 10. Um, so I, I will confess that uh, we I mean, we represent some clients in Arizona. Our work is more on the federal side. Um, we know that they they do have uh, the, the requirement the state approves uh, those rates and uh, they're, you know, they're limited in, in, I think, all respects. And I think that's also been used as a basis in some of the private pay situations where, you know, when a facility wants uh, discounted rates or wants to negotiate rates, I think it's also been used in that context uh, to say, well, these are the approved rates, right? So I know that's raised some issues as well. As far as the auditing requirements, I know there's a periodic revisitation of the rates and those have to be justified. I can't speak uh, beyond that. Well, yeah, and appreciate it. I just knew that, you know, obviously every state and how the municipalities operate, even during RFP processes, that's a big part of it is obviously being able to recognize what each state or local jurisdiction needs for their EMS and how they set it up for boundaries and such. So I appreciate that. I just, maybe I missed that. I apologize. No um, second question for Adam Beck and insurance. You, um, in your grid, you had a piece in there and behavioral health is getting really bad in America, as we all know, and how emergencies are moving more into that kind of, not only from uh, illnesses or for um, overdoses, but in there you had a notice about uh, authorization ahead of time. And I think from a provider standpoint, I was curious how you see that from the payers and the grid system and the inaccuracy sometimes that we get back from denials because it wasn't obviously maybe pre-authorized, but it did come in as an emergency and then out of network. Curious how you see behavioral health working within the setting right now. How I see, so, Sorry, could you just clarify? Because I mean, I certainly recognize, I think your, your point is emergency departments are increasingly becoming behavioral health treatment facilities and often first line behavioral health. Yeah, your grid facilities. had, you know, you obviously highlighted the section on out of network for emergency calls, but right underneath it, you had behavioral health and where that requires pre-authorization. And obviously in an emergency setting, sometimes that's coming in as a behavioral health need. I think we're seeing denials. We hear providers getting denied you know, for behavioral health needs, even though it came in via emergency because it didn't get through prior authorization. Mm -hmm. And I think that difference between multiple payers and how they look at that. So I was curious if you've seen any more of that or how um, payers are looking at that differently now, maybe because behavioral health is getting worse. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so, I mean, there, there's certainly, I, I guess, sorry, I want to take a little bit of an issue with that. Maybe it's just the a difference in, in phrasing on, you know, behavioral health is, is getting worse. I don't know if we're referring to behavioral health care or just the escalating behavioral health crisis. I mean, I would say the crisis. Is yeah, yeah. There's, there's an escalation of pandemic has worsened things, uh, opioids and fentanyl and substance use disorders certainly on the, on the rise. Um, and I think, you know, what, what you may be getting at is um, we need to fix prior authorization. Um, and um, I think you do see insurers um, moving towards different approaches, either to minimize or to streamline prior authorization um, or to take approaches such as gold carding, um, where you have companies like United, uh, which is not a, a member of my organization, but United Health Group, which um, has you know, instituted different gold carding plans uh, to allow providers uh, to skip any prior authorization requirements, um, including in the behavioral health space. Um, and so I think, you know, I think there needs to be a, a recognition. I'm looking at the, the SBC and I think I see where, you know, we're saying, you know, there's the common medical event on the left and, um, you know, if you need mental health, behavioral health or substance abuse services um, to note that, that prior authorization uh, may be required for either inpatient or outpatient services. Um, I don't know that those can apply in emergency services. Um, I think, you know, what that limitation is referring to is something like a, um, 
an addiction treatment center, um, which you know is I think a, a prime example of an area where pre-authorization is is critically important given the rates of fraud and and um, issues with with addiction treatment centers um, as a as an inpatient treatment for behavioral health care. Um, but I, I I think it sounds like you're you're raising a couple of of, of points that. I would, I think, tend to want to associate myself with, which is one, um, prior authorization is, is overly used at the moment, and it needs to be reduced in, in terms of the number of times in which it's called to be used. Um, it needs to be streamlined um, in the instances where it's still required, and that we really can't reasonably require pre-authorization um, in cases of, of emergency services, whether that's um, you know, a broken leg emergency or uh, a behavioral health emergency service. No, I appreciate that. I think that's where I was kind of asking because behavioral health, you, you just simply sometimes don't know when it is crossing over into other Oops. medical needs on an emergency yeah. standpoint. And it's as it gets worse, the, the struggles on getting the prior authorization, even as uh, Steve and Doug were mentioning in the emergency setting, how different EMS is than um, a clinical setting fixed in a location. So I appreciate that follow up. Thank you. And Adam, while you're here, I'm going to ask a follow-up question that I know one of our committee members has posted a question for um, Doug and uh, Steve in the chat. But while we're here, and you briefly mentioned essential health benefits, and of course, we talked just briefly about that yesterday, you indicated there's about 110 million Americans that are under ERISA mm -hmm. and, and technically aren't really under the requirements for the essential health benefit for emergency medical services, though. Y'all's data pretty much indicates that most health plans are covering emergency medical services. Yes. But they're not currently a requirement. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, there, there hasn't been a, a requirement, um, you know, really ever. We, we, you know, 1974, the passage of ERISA um, really recognized, uh, you know, the, the role of particularly multi-state employer plans um, and set up a system where there was going to be minimal uh levels of, of poor regulation um, or standards and really wanted to make sure that uh, these large, particularly multi-state group health plans were not subject to uh, regulations of you know, perhaps 50 different states. Um, and so we have ERISA regulation um, at the federal level, um, which is not particularly onerous and, and tends not to set um, min minimum coverage standards because there are other forces, um, you know, market-based forces that, um, you know, really, I think, call on those plans to, to cover the, the types of benefits um, that then show up in, in essential health benefits. And part of, I think that was, you know, a key part of the ACA debate, recognizing that for the vast majority of people with job-based coverage, their coverage was pretty good. They were happy with it. It was comprehensive. It was robust. Um, we've certainly seen you know, things like deductibles rise since then, which is highly problematic um, for consumers and it's problematic for accessing care. Um, but the the extent of benefits that were offered um, was in, in 2009, 2010 in employer plans looked at as, OK, there, we don't need to mandate a minimum level of coverage because the, they have been uh, providing comprehensive benefits for decades. What we do need to mandate um, are for individual market plans in particular, where um, it was much easier to carve out those types of services and you didn't have the market base uh, influences to ensure that um, you were offering comprehensive coverage. That's where essential health benefits came in um, for those smaller plans that cover either individuals or small group coverage. Um, but yes, no, they're um, they're not a mandate. There really are few mandates on uh, on the ERISA plans that most of us who have job based coverage uh, would find ourselves in. Okay, and did I hear you correctly? That and I know we're going to be getting to that this afternoon. We talked about some possible regulatory and legislative solutions to keep patients out of the middle and, ha and handle this issue. Did I hear yourself correctly that this is something that you wanted the committee to take up and maybe think through this concept? This concept of essential health benefits or I... Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't, I don't know that essential health benefits are, um, are gonna be a, a I, I, don't, I don't really know what they would necessarily have to do with, with resolving balanced bills. I think that whether we're talking a regulatory solution or a legislative solution, um, I think we're, we're really interested in making sure that there's um, a standard for reasonable payment in the absence of a contract. And so I don't, I, I think that'll have to be a key part of our discussion this afternoon um, and certainly for the work of this committee going forward. But I, I don't know that essential health benefits um, get, us, get us to a balanced billing solution. 
if for no other reason, then they're not going to affect um, the, you know, the nearly 180 million Americans who have um, large group or self-funded job-based coverage. All right, perfect. I've got one more. We've got about a minute here, Sean. I see your hand raised, but I want to get to Suzanne Prentice question to Doug and Steve really quickly. And that was, you talked about a requirement for a competitive selection process using an RFP. Is this a state or local? And is it enabling language for local government or does it apply statewide? Yeah, it's a great question. It, it's typically at the local level and it's typically through some state grant of authority to a local agency to do that. In some states, it's a county the county may delegate that to an EMS agency or EMS council, as such is done in California. Um, and it's interesting because oftentimes the state delegation of authority simply says this agency is in charge of EMS at the local level in their jurisdiction. It doesn't specifically empower them to regulate rates or put contractual provisions in those contracts, but they do under that general grant of authority to organize the EMS system. So it, it's a really interesting question, not, not surprisingly from, from Sue. So I, I appreciate that, uh, that question, but it's typically local through a much broader grant of authority from the state that does not specify rate regulation, but it's often simply done as part of that authority. Thanks for that information, Doug. And then Sean, you'll be the last question before we go to break. Uh, this is just for Adam. Uh, on the slide that you brought up that uh, you had circled sort of the benefit level of, um, you know, listed a dozen things and what the copay and, and in network or out of network percentage is. My question is, is there any particular regulation around how insurers present that information or if, I mean, often those lists look similar, but <clears throat> excuse me. But not quite the same. Like they, they may or may not have a couple of items in or out. Yeah, there is a standard. It's been a while since I know it used to be maintained by DOL. Um, there's a standard summary of benefits and coverage template, um, but it's not. It's it's almost. A, I think it's one of these situations where we would say it's a it's a floor, um, not a not as you know a strict uh, mandate of okay this box has to be here this box has you know you have to. Um, to list every every item. So that's where I think you would see, you see some variation, you know, a, a Blue Shield of California, one would look very similar, but perhaps not identical in part because the plans are gonna be different. Um, you know, if you're in, even in California and you're in a, you know, an Anthem or a United plan, um, your, you know, your plan may have different, um, you know, different drug coverage. Um, but for the most part, um, the, the reason that, that I said, you know, even down to the blue and white colors that that, um, that SBC tends to look very standard is that there is a, a standard template um, that insurers use, that plans use, um, but it's instructive or it's illustrative. It's not necessarily mandatory. That's a very good question, Sean. That same question came up on the air ambulance side. And Adam, you are a different, right? We got a lot of coaching through that. And I know that that'll come up when we start really talking more about consumer and insurance disclosures as well. Um, and then you'll see some stuff post in the um, uh, um, uh, in the um, uh, the comment area as well. But Tara, I'm gonna turn this right back over to you so we can go to break. Thank you. We will now take our midday break, and we will resume at 12:05 with session three on ballots billing. <laughs> 